अभी वो शेयर करेगा फिर अटेंडेंस कैसे लोग मैं यहीं पे मूव कर रही मुझे नहीं पता एक्जेक्टली अटेंडेंस कैसे लेना मैं काम कर रही मैं विनोद ने कैसे ले लिया उसका स्क्रीनशॉट सब बंद होगा वो तो सब शायद फोटो से खींच के लिया अपने फोन से कनेक्ट किया है ना तो उसी से ले लिया फोन मतलब इसने तो आएगा ना रीडिंग के लिए जैसे मैंने यानी वे मैंने लास्ट टाइम सीआर को बोल दिया तू दे दे तो वो 100 पार्टिसिपेंट्स थे उसको वो लोग को होल क्लास था मैं कंपनी में यहीं पे ले जैसे ऐसे आ जाता है सर फोन का स्क्रीन पे जो है मतलब ऐसे एक-एक करके पार्टिसिपेंट्स का लिस्ट आ जाएगा यहाँ पे ऐसे निकल जाते मेरा घड़ी स्टार्ट हो गया ना है तू पाउनी है है अरे अनेक खन हलो उसको पता ही नहीं एसी पंखा आज गर्मी ज्यादा है या हाँ अब ज्वाइन कर रहे हैं ये पैरेलल कर दिया तुमने मिररिंग कर दिया इसके इसके साथ यहाँ पे जो Hello, can you hear me? हेलो हेलो यस सर कैन यू हियर मी यस सर यस ओके शैल आई स्टार्ट देन हेलो यस सर यस सर यू कैन स्टार्ट सर ओके सो टुडे विल डिस्कस अबाउट थोरेसिक आउटलेट सिंड्रोम So thoracic outlet syndrome 
It's uh, actually neurovascular symptoms in upper extremities due to pressure on nerves and uh, vessels in the thoracic outlet area. The symptoms uh, depends on the amount of compression and uh, what structures are compressed or irritated. So uh, symptoms are according to that. So depending on the exact site of injury or uh, compression uh, of the neurovascular bundles, uh, three types of uh, syn uh, syndromes or uh, symptoms can develop. It, it may be neurological uh, symptoms, it may be venous, or it may be arterial. Most common is uh, neurological because uh, the uh, nerves are very much sensitive so equal amount of pressure on uh, vessels may not reflect symptoms but uh, symptoms will be reflected in nerves because they are much sensitive so the maximum patients uh, develop the symptoms related to nerves then to venous and lastly arterial So, uh, symptoms, uh, in some cases it may be mixed or it may be purely neurogenic, arterial or venous. So, uh, before the symptoms develop, there is a period of uh, asymptomatic period where th there is thoracic outlet syndrome is there, but it is misdiagnosed because it mimics symptoms of many other diseases. So, there may be... Uh, There may be a delay in presentation of symptoms uh, before, uh, uh, but uh, the disease process may, uh, might start much uh, earlier, but symptoms will uh, develop uh, later. According to the new classification, it's not divided uh, into neurogenic, arterial or venous, rather it is uh, broadly divided into uncomplicated and complicated form. In uncomplicated form, it is uh, most of the time is diagnosed uh, with some other diseases, but here also uh, the symptoms may be again neurogenic arterial or venous type. And in complicated form, it is easy to diagnose. It is easy to diagnose, but uh, it's very late by the time disease has progressed too much. The uncomplicated form is the most common and the most undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Uncomplicated uh, form uh, may present as a mild to severe pain, positional paresthesia of the upper limbs, uh, but no atrophy of the hand muscles. The symptoms may be intermittent, but the complicated form is easy to diagnose, but it's too late. Slowly progressive unilateral atrophic weakness. In a complicated form, the, all the complications of this uh, outlet obstruction will develop. In neurogenic type, there may be atrophic weakness, uh, uh, atrophy of the hand muscles, intrinsic hand muscles, and there will be weakness. In arterial uh, type of disease, uh, there may be ischemia of the finger and the hands, and there may be thrombosis and embolism. And in uh, venous type, again, there may be thrombosis of the subclavian or the axillary veins. Pain and paresthesia of the upper limb is very common in all the three types because it's mainly neurogenic and uh, neurogenic symptoms are uh, most of the time uh, common because they're very sensitive. The nerves are very sensitive to uh, minimal pressure, minimal irritation. There may be sometimes uh, shoulder, neck or chest pain, facial pain, occipital headaches and uh, many times these are ignored. And it is present in both uncomplicated as well as complicated forms. Epidemiology, incidence is 1 to 2 percent, age between 20 to 50 percent, uh, 20 to 50 years of age, more common in females, 3 to 1 ratio. 
no racial predominance and symptoms as already discussed more common is the neurogenic type than the venous type than the arterial type because nerve uh, more sensitive to uh, compression so the neurogenic ven veins are uh, relatively more sensitive to compression than arteries so venous symptoms are more than arterial symptoms because the arterial pressure uh, is much more so it can overcome minimal amount of pressure so arterial symptoms are the least and uh, neurogenic symptoms the most common uh, before going into the details uh, we must know a little bit about the anatomy of this thoracic outlet uh, the interscalene triangle it is actually by the two scalenous muscle, the anterior scalenous muscle and the scalenous medius posteriorly, and uh, inferiorly the first rib. So these muscles originate in the cervical vertebra and uh, they go down and uh, uh, attaches themselves to the first rib. And uh, so it forms a triangle, a space between these two muscles through which the brachial plexus comes out. So uh, any compression of the brachial plexus is possible here. Then the costoclavicular space. This space uh, is actually anteriorly by the clavicle and posteriorly in the medial part by the first rib and uh, laterally by the upper border of the scapula. And when it uh, goes further down then the pectoralis minor space anteriorly by the pectoralis minor and posteriorly by the chest wall in the next figure you can see this nicely uh, here is the scalenus muscle anterior muscle posterior uh, medius scalenus medius they are attached to the first rib here and the brachial plexus is coming out then the second space is the costoclavicular so the costoclavicular means between the rib and the clavicle so this is the first rib and this is the clavicle and the space in between. Uh, immediately this uh, space is uh, posteriorly by the clavi uh, first rib but laterally here lies the scapula. So this is the space anteriorly by the clavicle, posteriorly medial part by the first rib and laterally by the scapula and uh, vessels, uh, neurovascular bundle is passing in between the anterior and the posterior bony structures. So any compression here will lead to the symptoms in the upper limb here. And the, the third space is behind the pectoralis minor. Here, this is the pectoralis minor and neurovascular bundle is uh, passing uh, behind the pectoralis minor uh, and between the chest wall. So any compression here again is going to cause symptoms. Here it is shown nicely. The scalenus, uh, scaleni triangle between the scalenus anterior, scalenus medius, and this is the first rib. You can see the brachial plexus and the axillary artery out here. Then the costoclavicular space, this is the clavicle, and this is the uh, first rib. So this is the coastal component, this is the clavicular component, and in between lies the neurovascular bundle. And the third one is the pectoralis minor space. Here is the pectoralis minor muscle and the chest wall behind. So any compression here is going to cause symptoms in the upper limb. So the contents uh, already discussed, brachial plexus, subclavian artery, and the subclavian vein. This uh, subclavian artery and the brachial plexus lies in the interscalenous uh, triangle, subclavian vein in the costoclavicular space, and in pectoralis minor space, all the three structures are there. So uh, according to the site of compression, symptoms can be determined easily. So costoclavicular space, uh, it will be the venous symptoms, if it is in the scalene triangle, then the vein will be spared, uh, but the artery and the nerves will be affected. But if it is in the pectoralis minor space, all the three structures will be affected. Now, etiology. 
uh, why this uh, syndrome develops, this thoracic outlet syndrome develops, there may be some anatomical defects. Uh, this anatomical defect may be in the bone, maybe in the muscle, or uh, due to some other swelling. So let us discuss about the bony abnormalities first. So the cervical rib, if the uh, cervical rib is there, so definitely it will occupy some space and the space for the neurovascular bundle will be reduced and there are every chance of compression over this neurovascular bundle and uh, resulting in symptoms. The long uh, C7 transverse process again will occupy some space and uh, uh, will lead to some symptoms. Abnormal bands and ligaments in this uh, area will compress upon the neurovascular bundle and will result in symptoms. And then the fracture of the clavicle, uh, as in the costoclavicular uh, space, any fracture in, in clavicle or the, of the first rib will uh, disturb the neurovascular bundle in this space and will lead to the symptoms of uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. Exhaustosis. This is a bony swelling which will occupy the space. This uh, compact space will be reduced and uh, will cause compression over the neurovascular bundle and will lead to the symptoms. Then the muscle anomalies. Anomalous insertion of the scalene muscles. If uh, the triangle is very narrow, then again the space will be uh, reduced and will lead to the symptoms. Scalene muscle hypertrophy will again lead to the uh, reduction in the space of between the two scalene muscles and will lead to the symptoms. Then scalene manumus again will occupy space and will reduce the space for neurovascular bundle and lead to the symptoms. If the brachial plexus instead of passing between the gap, uh, gap between the scalenous anterior and scalenous medius, if it passes through the uh, mass of uh, scalenous anterior, then uh, with each movement of uh, the scalenous muscle will lead to the symptoms, will lead to the compression of the brachial plexus and uh, resulting the neurogenic symptoms. A broad uh, insertion of uh, scalenous uh, muscle will uh, again lead to the reduction in the interscalene space and will lead to the less space for neurovascular bundle and resulting in symptoms. Then tumors of the soft tissue or of bone will uh, occupy the space. This narrow space will be reduced and uh, it will affect the neurovascular bundle. Trauma, trauma to the brachial plexus uh, will lead to the similar symptoms. Then the poor posture will again uh, lead to the reduction in the space and uh, development of symptoms. Repetitive activity, uh, as uh, in uh, computer engineers, they sit in front of the computer, people sitting in front of computer for a long time, uh, constantly typing, will this repetitive movement will lead to reduction of uh, the space and uh, development of symptoms. This repetitive movements may be seen in athletes and swimmers, baseball pitchers. So uh, this will uh, lead to the reduction of the space and uh, increase in symptoms. Obesity, the fat will occupy the narrow space and will uh, lead to reduction in the space for neurovascular bundle and uh, uh, development of symptoms. Pregnancy, the retention of water can lead to the reduction in the space and uh, development of symptoms. Now let us talk about the cervical rib. Cervical rib is extra rib actually, supernumerary rib, which arises from the C7 vertebra and so that's why sometimes known as neck ribs. It is uh, located above the first rib it is present in less than 1% of the normal population and uh, amongst the cervical patients with the cervical rib, 
five to nine percent present with the thoracic outlet syndrome. It is bilateral in 50% of the cases and more common on the right side. So in this picture, you can see the cervical rib. Uh, this is the first vertebra. So this is the first vertebra. Uh, sorry, uh, first uh, rib. So this is the first rib. And this is the C7 vertebra from where this extra uh, rib has uh, generated. And on this side, this rib may be only a fibrous band, present as only a fibrous band from vertebra to first rib, or it may be partially bony and partially uh, uh, fibrous band, or it may be a totally bony structure. So it may present in different forms but all are known as cervical ribs. So these are the different types of cervical ribs. So here you can see, this is the scalene muscle and uh, uh, scalene anterior, scalene medius, and this is the space and the cervical rib is occupying the space. So it is reducing the space for um, this uh, artery as well as uh, the brachial plexus which passes through this uh, gap. So you can see the effect of compression over uh, artery. There is dilatation just posterior to the compression. So how this cervical rib uh, looks like in X-ray? Here, here is the first rib, and here lies the um, extra rib that is the cervical rib on both sides. It is shown by the arrow. Now the clinical features, clinical features uh, as already discussed, uh, mostly neurogenic uh, symptoms, then the venous and then the arterial, 95% uh, neurogenic, 4% venous and 1% arterial symptoms. Such big difference in frequency of clinical manifestation of neurogenic is due to the high sensitivity of the nerves for compression and irritation, already discussed. So what are these neurogenic symptoms? So um, there may be paresthesia, there may be pain in the shoulder, arm, forearm and fingers, occipital headache, and uh, weakness of the forearm and hand. So neurogenic symptoms, uh, though we uh, consider it under uh, thoracic outlet sy syndrome, but uh, in true sense, uh, the interscalene space is actually not thoracic outlet uh, space, uh, outlet syndrome. It is between the two scalene muscles, uh, nothing to do with uh, thoracic outlet except uh, the subclavian artery, which is coming from uh, thorax. The brachial plexus is only originating in the neck and coming out to the uh, interscalene space. So a cervical outlet syndrome and true thoracic outlet syndrome. So um, the lower part is the true thoracic outlet syndrome and upper is the cervical outlet syndrome or upper thoracic outlet syndrome. Arterial symptoms of thoracic outlet syndrome, there may be fatigue, weakness, cold, uh, upper limb claudication, thrombosis, paresthesia, gangrene, Raynaud's phenomenon. This is common to any arterial compression will lead to uh, this sort of symptoms. Then the venous symptom, edema, venous distension, collateral formation, cyanosis, and there may be thrombosis. This is known, uh, known as paget schroeter syndrome. There may be thrombosis in the subclavian vein due to repetitive uh, uh, movement in that area. Now, how will you diagnose this thoracic uh, outlet uh, syndrome? First, the clinical examination. So, some clinical tests will be there. The ruse uh, test or elevated arm test. Here you can see in this picture how this test is done. The uh, arm is uh, abducted and forearm is uh, elevated. 
So the patient seated with arms uh, ab uh, above 90 degrees of abduction and full external rotation with head in the neutral position. Patient opens and closes hands into the fist. So repeatedly uh, closes, uh, makes the fist and opens it and for three minutes. Then the symptom starts developing. The, uh, as discussed earlier, the neurogenic symptoms will develop first. Uh, then the other symptoms will appear. The sensitivity of this test is 50 to 80 percent and specificity 30 to 100 percent. So this is the ruse test. It may be false positive in carpal tunnel syndrome if there is compression of uh, nerves here. So uh, that will result in symptoms here but uh, it is not actually thoracic outlet syndrome which is uh, ge generating here. So uh, it might mimic the symptoms and so uh, false positive in carpal tunnel syndrome or ulnar neuropathy or fibromyalgia. The next test is the Edson maneuver. If you see the uh, picture, then you can understand the surgeon is putting uh, the stethoscope here to he hear the brewing and uh, then arm is uh, again abducted and uh, elbow raised and uh, the difference between uh, the earlier test and this is the head is turned to the uh, other side the contralateral side so the compression will increase this increases the compression further and uh, the symptoms will develop as it was in the ruse test. So uh, neurogenic symptoms will develop here and arterial compression leading to brewery can be here, uh, can be heard by the surgeon with stethoscope. So uh, addition in this test is the turning the face to the contralateral side and trying to hear the brewery uh, because this compression will lead to the turbulence in the flow and that will lead to the formation of fluid. Then uh, writes hyperabduction test. So this is hyperabduction. Uh, the arm is raised almost 180 degrees. So this hyperabduction is uh, idea is to increase the compression even further. So arm hyperabducted to 180 degree, diminishing the ra radial pulse. So the compression on the subclavian artery is much more here in hyperabduction test. And uh, here you can see uh, it leads to compression, severe compression here when the arm is hyperabducted. And symptoms of uh, this uh, diminishing radial pulse. So. Here you can see the surgeon is trying to feel the radial pulse uh, while uh, hyperabducting the arm. And neurogenic symptoms uh, are same in all the uh, three tests. So in uh, Edson maneuver, you're trying to hear the brewery. In uh, uh, Ruse test, um, surgeon is just observing the patient. Patient is uh, following the instructions. Here, uh, surgeon is trying to hear the brewery. Here, surgeon is trying to feel the radial pulse with diminished volume. Then, postoclavicular manner, chest is uh, pulled forward, uh, and uh, hand, uh, the arm is uh, moving behind. So uh, the increasing the main idea is to increase the compression here and development of symptoms. Actually, we exaggerate the pathology uh, for development of neurovascular symptoms and then diagnose it. So what is done in this maneuver? Patient sits straight with arms at the side. Radial pulse is assessed. Patient retracts and depresses the shoulder. Uh, while protruding the chest. Position is held for one minute. There is change in the radial pulse or pain and paresthesia. So the idea is same in all the tests. 
you exaggerate the pathology and try to feel the pulse or hear the turbulence and development of neurogenic symptoms. Again, the same uh, cervical rotation, lateral flexion test. What is done? Patient seated. Examiner passively rotates the head away from the affected side and gently flexes the neck forward to uh, end range, moving the ear towards the ventral chest. Forward flexion, uh, flexion part of the movement is notably decreased with hard end feel. So the idea is to exaggerate the pathology and try to feel the symptoms. Upper limb tension test. So uh, this is the position of the upper limbs. Position one, position two, and position three. In position three, the head is uh, turned to the contralateral side and this will uh, develop the symptoms here. So this is about the upper limb test, upper limb tension test. Then this is a bit, uh, uh, there is some amount of intervention is required in this test, lidocaine scalene block test. So <clears throat> a more objective examination is the lidocaine scalene block test. Under image guidance, uh, ultrasound or fluoroscopy, this lidocaine injection is given and symptoms reduces. Till now, we did all the tests where the symptoms were exaggerated uh, by uh, exaggerating the pathology. But here, the symptoms are reduced by injection of uh, lidocaine into the scalene muscle. So, uh, this is basically uh, paralyzing the uh, nerves out there or anesthetizing the nerves out there so the symptoms uh, reduces. Now, uh, earlier also we discussed the positive, uh, false positive uh, test, uh, root tests, was uh, seen in carpal tunnel syndrome, so differential diagnosis also. The carpal tunnel syndrome, spinal canal tumors, shoulder myositis, angina pectoris, Reynolds disease, upper uh, ulnar nerve compression due to epicondylitis will all mimic the symptoms of thora thoracic uh, outlet syndrome. So uh, this list comes in the differential diagnosis. Now we'll go for investigation. What investigations you will do? So uh, we generally go for the chest X-ray, then cervical, uh, cervical spine X-ray, ultrasound, Doppler, then MRI, then vascular imaging. This may be conventional or this may be uh, with the MRI, uh, this uh, digital subtraction angiography and the nerve conduction studies. And the X-ray of the neck can uh, show you the cervical ribs, elongated the C7 transverse process, degenerative spine, and bony destruction in uh, neoplasm, maybe primary or maybe secondary. In this picture, again, the cervical rib can be seen. Here the clavicle was fractured and you can see a big callus is there. Uh, I'm moving my cursor around the callus. So that callus can compress the neurovascular bundle down there in the costoclavicular space and will lead to the symptoms. Then uh, color Doppler. Color Doppler can show you the flow velocity in the subclavian artery and the subclavian vein. So uh, the effects of compression in one there will be turbulence and in, in the other the reduction in the movement can be seen 
with the color Doppler study. Arteriography and the venography will show you the compression site. Angiography already discussed uh, conventional angiography or uh, this uh, magnetic resonance angiography that is a digital subtraction angiography. And this is uh, to plan the surgery. How to do surgery? The exact uh, site of pathology can be determined with angiography. Here you can see uh, this angiogram looks normal, but when the arm is abducted, this uh, arrow can show you this compression. The, the continuity of the vessel is lost here in the picture. This is due to compression when the arms are abducted. So there will be some production of uh, symptoms also. And in picture also, it can be seen that uh, there is compression of the artery. Here also, you can see the arterial compression. The lumen is much bigger here, much bigger here, but it is narrower here in the abducted uh, position. Again, uh, if there is pathology, in this uh, postoclavicular space, this will lead to the compression of the vessel. Axillary artery will be compressed here. Sorry, subclavian artery, not axillary artery. Subclavian artery will be compressed here. Same thing in MRI. Then electrodiagnostic studies. This is nerve conduction study. Uh, nerve conduction study, you can uh, notice uh, that uh, the velocity of conduction is reduced when there is compression over the nerve. Uh, the uh, sensory potential is reduced, motor potential is reduced in, in the ulnar nerve in comparison to the median nerve. Treatment. So non-operative treatment initially. And if it fails, then we go for the operative treatment, non-operative treatment. So in the etiology, we have seen that uh, constant repeated uh, movement and uh, bad posture leads to uh, the symptoms. So posture improving exercises, breathing exercises, uh, avoid the aggravating activities, avoid repetitive movements, analgesics and physiotherapy. Then the botulinum toxin injection this uh, takes some time to uh, relieve. It takes around two weeks to relieve the symptoms. But uh, once uh, symptoms are relieved, it remains uh, relieved for around three months. Then the surgical treatment. Surgical treatment, uh, if the symptoms persist uh, with non-operative treatment, if there is vascular compression, progression of the neurological symptoms and when the nerve conduction velocity is less than 60 meter per second then we go for the surgical treatment the what are the surgical treatments we generally go for the first rib resection and anterior scalenectomy this uh, in the figure you can see so there, if there is compression here if you release this muscle from here so the compression will be released. So scalenectomy can reduce the symptoms. Or uh, resection of the first rib. If the first rib is resected, then also the space will be increased and the compression will be reduced. So uh, first rib resection, anterior scalenectomy, cervical rib resection, transaxillary approach for supracla or supraclavicular approach. And if there is aneurysm formation due to this compression, the, this might need uh, reconstruction of the artery. In the arterial uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, It is indicated for both venous and arterial symptoms. Uh, initially, we go for the anticoagulation therapy 
and uh, then the surgical intervention. Severe ischemia requires embolectomy or thrombolysis uh, with thoracic outlet decompression. So you'll have to decompress the th thoracic outlet, whether by sclerectomy or by resection of the rib or by re resection of the first rib or uh, cervical rib. Uh, along with that, the effects of this compression uh, might be there in the vessels, whether artery or uh, vein. There may be thrombosis, there may be embolism, or there may be aneurysm. So you'll have to correct that also in addition to correction of the compression. The same thing in the venous uh, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. Neurogenic uh, finished. Hello. Oh, remaining meeting time is there. Huh? Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. I'm almost finished. So avoidance of the activities that precipitate the symptoms, then the ergonomic modifications of the workplace, you'll have to change the chair, table and the chair of the per person who is constantly sitting in front of the computer so that the less pressure is on his neck and shoulders. So that will reduce the symptoms and uh, selective use of the medications such as uh, NSAID or antidepressant and muscle relaxant. Physiotherapy is required. Conservative management for 8 to 12 weeks. Uh, if symptoms persist, uh, even after conservative management of 8 to 12 weeks, then we go for the surgery. So this is uh, all about the thoracic outlet syndrome. So uh, we should uh, understand that the most common symptom is uh, neurogenic, then the venous and then the arterial. So similarly, the uh, treatment should also be concentrated in such a way that it relieves the most uh, disturbing symptoms and uh, uh, treated in that way. In uh, addition to that, in uh, arterial and the venous uh, pathology, you'll have to treat uh, the complications also in addition to release of the obstruction. That is uh, treatment of the thrombosis, embolism and aneurysm. Okay, thank you. Uh, CR, can you please uh, send me the attendance? Okay, sir. I'll send you the attendance. Hello. Yes, sir. I'll send you that. 96 students are there. 96 students are there. 